So today we're going to talk about the theme of burnout and self-care. And we're going to cover this for the next few weeks or so. And, and so today is more of a, uh, an overview kind of sermon for us. And so Mark chapter 6, uh, why don't you join me there? Beginning of verse 30, we'll get back there in a moment. But let's pray. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. I bet some of us in this room, you are tired. And if you're tired and uh, exhausted, God wants to speak to you today. And so let's pray together. Lord, I pray that you would breathe life in us, that we would have our lives infused with your love, with your grace, with your strength, with your peace. And Lord, in an exhausted world, what we are longing for is deep and abiding rest. And so come, Holy Spirit, open our eyes so that we may see what you want us to see, our ears, Lord, so that we may hear what you want us to hear and open our hearts so that we would receive every good gift you have for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. When we get on a plane, we go through a very familiar routine. You uh, pack your luggage in the overhead bin, you sit down, you buckle yourself in, and you send some text messages, you see if there's anyone going to sit next to you, is this person going to talk to me, is this person going to, we go through the whole thing there. The flight attendant gets up and does their demonstration, their usual demonstration. They introduce themselves to us. And at some point in the demonstration, the flight attendant always says, uh, in the event of some kind of emergency. And I don't know why people tend to tune out or not pay attention whenever they say, in light of an emergency, for whatever reason, people tune out. But they say, in light of some kind of decompression emergency, the, the flight attendant says that the passenger should always fit his or her own mask on first, oxygen mask, before helping children, the disabled, or persons requiring assistance. And as I thought about that story uh, and that, that, you know, the the speech that they give, the demonstration that they give, the first time I heard it, I thought, that's not nice. Like the first thing that would come to mind is in case of an emergency, I want to take care of my child. I want to take care of someone who might be vulnerable. But the uh, instructions make perfect sense because if I lose oxygen, how am I going to help somebody else? And if you lose oxygen, how are you going to help anyone else? And so as I thought about this message today and thought about this sermon today, I thought I'd like us and like myself to be our spiritual flight attendant. I'd like to remind everyone in this room that we are actually in an emergency and that the emergency that we are in relates to the kind of exhaustion and burnout that permeates our culture. Many people, many Christians for that matter, are living without an oxygen mask. And many of us have experienced some kind of burnout at one point of our lives or another. Burnout is this deep sense that I have nothing to offer anyone. And this comes as a result of exhaustion. This comes as a result of overwork. And all of us at one point or another perhaps have experienced this. Marriages crumble because of this idea of burnout. People enter into depression because of burnout. People lose jobs because of burnout. Pastors fail, moral failures because of this idea of burnout. But the core reason why we experience burnout is not because we work hard. The reason we experience burnout is because we only work hard. This is why Parker Palmer, the great Quaker writer, could say that burnout is a state of emptiness to be sure, but it does not result from giving all I have. It merely reveals the nothingness from which I was trying to give in the first place. Burnout ultimately reveals the nothingness from which I was trying to give in the first place. And so self-care, that phrase, self-care, is one of the most important conversations we need to have as the people of God. Because we are prone to walking through life, helping a lot of other people, 
and not taking care of ourselves. It's like my mother. My mother, whenever she would cook dinner, she'd serve everyone and everyone would eat. She'd be the last to eat if she ate at all. And many of us can live our lives so much other focus that in the process we burn out. And yet God has created you to be a gift to the world. God has created you to be a gift to your family. God has created you to be a gift to your workplace, a gift to our church. But how can we be a gift when we are burned out? And so we're going to explore this idea. And this this quote here really is going to serve as the the, the big focus for us over the next few weeks. That Parker Palmer says that self-care is never a selfish act. It's simply good stewardship of the only gift I have. The gift I was put on earth to offer others. What's that gift? You are that gift. That God made you to be a gift. And self-care is never a selfish act. It is simply good stewardship. Now, when we think about self-care, I want to make a distinction before I get into this passage in Mark. Because there is uh, two kinds of self-care. There is what I'm calling cultural self-care and what I'm calling kingdom self-care. Uh, There's a lot of overlap between the two. The difference relates as it pertains to the theological basis and the motivation behind self-care. Now, when our culture thinks about self-care, we think of naps and vacation and getting your nails done and getting your hair done. Or if you're from Brooklyn, you say getting your hair did. Okay, you get your hair did if you're from Brooklyn. And we think, you know, I want to do all that self-care. And absolutely, that is very important. And that thing is, we need, listen, let's get our hair did, all right? Let's, 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 Let's go to the spa, okay? Listen, every birthday, every April 17th, every birthday that comes along, I go to the spa. Ah, a couple of hours. I'm doing some self-care. And so I love this cultural uh, understanding of self-care, but it's limited. And what happens is two things as we think about cultural self-care. What can easily happen in cultural self-care is self-care becomes a means to escape reality. And so we do self-care, but it's a way to escape the problems that are before me. Actually, a way to reinforce living in illusions. The other thing that cultural self-care can do is self, cultural self-care can keep us self-absorbed. That life is just about me about what I want to do with my life. And so while there are some helpful things to cultural self-care, it has many, many limits. And so uh, the the kingdom of God offers us a different way of self-care in which there's some overlap, but it comes from a different theological place, and it comes from a different motivation. And ultimately, the kind of kingdom self-care is the only way that can position us to truly care for others. And there's no one who models this idea of self-care and this practice of self-care like our Lord Jesus. Jesus shows us the way. Jesus models for us in a world of exhaustion what it means to do good self-care. Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 30, hear the word of the Lord. Mark writes, the apostles gathered around Jesus And reported to him all they had done and taught. And then because so many people were coming and going that they did not have a chance to eat, he skipped lunch that day. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. The gospel of Mark, I believe, is a gospel written for New Yorkers. The gospel of Mark is very unique. Every gospel is unique. Every gospel comes from a different vantage point. But I believe the gospel of Mark is written for New Yorkers. I say this because when when Mark actually wrote uh, the gospel, he's writing to a Roman audience, a really cosmopolitan audience. And a cosmopolitan audience that was going from one thing to the next, the church that was going one thing to the next. And so consequently, what you see in the gospel of Mark over and over again is one word come up consistently. The word is immediately. 
Immediately comes up so much in the Gospel of Mark. Immediately Jesus did this. And when he was done with that, immediately Jesus did that. Immediately he went, and on and on it goes. Jesus goes from one thing to the next. It is a gospel written for New Yorkers. We go from one thing to the next. And and so when you read the Gospel of Mark, you see Jesus is consistently bombarded with sickness and with problems and with religious leaders and pain. He goes from one thing to the next. And in this fast-paced society, we need really a gospel that can relate to us. And this is what Mark is. And so when we pick up in chapter 6, so much has already taken place. And we consistently see throughout this gospel a crisis of activity, a kind of crisis that leads to burnout. And so Jesus invites his disciples to come away with him because of the intensity of activity. There came a point in Jesus' life and his ministry where he needed to get away. He would do the work. He would heal people. He would set people free. And then on a regular basis, he would step into a solitary place. This was Jesus' rhythm. He'd work hard. He'd heal. He'd raise the dead. And then he would get away. But the thing you see consistently in the gospel is every time Jesus got away, people found him. They always found him whenever he went away. And I was thinking about this message. I thought it's similar to children. When you have children, when you go to the bathroom, you, can't, you can run, but you can't hide. They find you anyway. And it's like this is the message of the gospel of Mark in a, in, in a snapshot here. Jesus gets away, and they find him over and over and over again. And so in the Gospel of Mark, it actually says this on a few occasions in the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. A couple of times, he went into a house to get away from people, to hide from them. He did not want anyone to know it. And so Jesus recognized, I need to get away. Jesus recognized, I have my limits. And this recognition allowed him to live with a centeredness and a rootedness out of which his activity flowed. This is why the great late uh, philosopher Dallas Willard out of the University of Southern California, when he was describing, how can you describe Jesus in one word? He didn't say powerful. He didn't say almighty. He said the word that he uses to describe Jesus as he's seen in the Gospels is the word relax. That consistently you see Jesus relaxed. You never see Jesus going, ah, I forgot to heal the leper. And he runs back. (laughs) You never, you never see Jesus as he's interrupted. So he's about to heal someone and someone enters. He goes, listen, I got this two o'clock appointment. I can't heal you. I'll be back. Excuse me. And he runs. You never, he's centered. He's rooted. He's relaxed. And the reality is, That word relax does not describe our lives, especially in this city. We are anything but relaxed. And we are overwhelmed and burned out and exhausted because we don't know how to get away. And we're often overwhelmed Because we don't hear this word from Jesus that he invites his disciples to. If it were not for Jesus pulling his disciples away, they would, three things would have most likely happened to them. They would have either died because of exhaustion or the issues pertaining to exhaustion. They would have stopped following Jesus. This is too much. I'm not following this guy anymore. Or they would have become addicted to their work. Three very real temptations for us. They would have either died of exhaustion, they would have stopped following Jesus altogether, or they would have become addicted to their work. And so the passage that we just saw, they did many great things. They were healing the sick, they were raising the dead, and then they could have easily at that moment gotten addicted to their success, addicted to the miraculous, and at that moment, Jesus doesn't say, keep going, he says, let's get away. Because he recognized they would either die of exhaustion, they would stop following him, or they would get addicted to their work. And most of us, many of us, if not all of us in this room, are like these disciples, facing these three temptations. Many of us don't know how to care for our souls, 
how to care for ourselves, and in, and in the process, we are on the verge of burnout. Now, I want to say something that uh, I, I recognize in this room, the deep challenges that face people in our church and that our people face. In our church, we have single parents. In our church, we have parents of young children. In our church, we have parents of teenagers, tired, exhausted, busy. In our church, we have people below the poverty line trying to make ends meet, working nonstop just to survive. In our church, we have people in a high-stress work environment, hard to stop. In our church, we have people caring for aging parents. And so we have the wide spectrum of activity in our church. And so when I was preparing this message, I had all of you in mind. And while our situations might be different from one person to the next, there's one thing that unites us, one thing that is universal, and it is this, that like Jesus' disciples, many of us have a hard time stepping away. We have a hard time with self-care. Now, some of us are very driven. This past Thursday, I was, I was in the office. I was working with from one meeting to the next, one meeting to the next, and I started working on my sermon. I realized I hadn't even eaten lunch that day. And then I'm reading on self-care. I'm like, it's not a good sign here. You know, it's not a good sign. We can be so driven that we don't do self-care. Some of us uh, never saw it modeled. Our family of origin, we never saw from our parents. We we don't know. We never saw it modeled how to do good self-care, how to be pulled away. All we saw is do one thing after the next thing after the next thing. Some of us believe, and we're going to unpack this in the weeks to come, that we don't have a right to self-care. And you've heard some bad theology about this and some bad teaching about this. Oh, it's ultimately, uh, which it comes out of bad theology. I've heard pastors say, I will rest when I get to heaven. And I'm like, you're going to get to heaven really soon. That's what's going to (laughs) happen. And so we all have our scripts. We all have our stories. We all have the things that keep us moving towards exhaustion. And in the process of our high activity, Jesus offers us an invitation. Every day Jesus offers you a specific invitation. And many times we can't hear it over the noise and activity that permeates our existence. But Jesus offers you an invitation every single week, every single day, multiple times a day. We see it in verse 31. Jesus says to his disciples, and he says to you, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. This should be our verse of the week. Jesus says it every day to you. Sometimes this is an invitation to get away from your work, to stop for five minutes, to just come with him for five minutes, to be still in prayer. This invitation, uh, many times, I would say all the time, is an invitation to stop every seven days to keep Sabbath. Where Jesus says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. This invitation, many times, is a way of reorganizing our lives in such a way that we live out of a place of deep rest. Now, what's interesting about this invitation is that when Jesus invites his disciples to come away, many times when he invited them was at the height of activity. It was at the height of activity, and then Jesus said, come away. Notice Jesus many times doesn't wait until all the activity is finished and then says, all right, fellas, let's get away. There were times when Jesus would heal many people, and then there'd be a whole bunch of people here that were not healed. And Jesus is going, all right, we got to go. And could you imagine? But what about me? How could he be healed? And he said, just one more, Jesus. Just one. Can you just do one more? And at the height of the activity, Jesus would say, guys, let's get away. And Jesus models something for us because we believe the lie that when the work calms down, then I'll care for myself. Here's the reality. The work never calms down. There's always an email to respond to. 
I cleared out my inbox. I posted a picture on Instagram that it was, I was so happy. I had no more emails. And two minutes later, someone sends me an email. I think they saw the picture too. And they sent the email. Evil people, evil, evil, evil people. The work never, there's a, there's a birthday party to go to, there's an obligation, there's an errand to run. The work never stops. And so we are to be like the guys in the food network that when uh, iron chef and you have an hour to do your work and they're doing the thing. And when that hour comes and they say, put your hands up at some point in our day. At some point in our week, we just have to, whatever we're doing, at the height of activity, put our hands in the air and wave them like you just don't care, all right? All right? Let's practice that. Let's practice that. All right? Your hands everywhere. Everybody, hands in the air. Here we go, hands in the air. And wave them like you just don't care care, all right? At some point in the week, during high activity, you have to just say, I need to come away. Jesus is inviting you, come away with me. Come with me to a quiet place by yourself and get some rest. At the height of their activity. How could Jesus do this? How could Jesus, at the height of activity, so many people needing him, how could he step away? Well, I think Jesus knew something about the Father that we often miss. How does Jesus do this self-care? Well, I'll say it this way. That Jesus modeled self-care as he lived in the world because he knew that God sufficiently cared for the world. Jesus modeled self-care as he lived in the world because he knew that God sufficiently cared for the world. Self-care requires us to let go of our obsession to fix everything, to solve everything, to know everything. Self-care is a way of confessing Jesus alone is Lord. Jesus alone is Savior. God alone is the one who's holding this thing together. This is why in Colossians chapter 1, it says he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. When you're doing self-care, you're confessing two things. You're confessing only God is Savior and I need saving. Therefore, I will step away. Kingdom self-care is a way of confessing our insufficiency. And confessing that God is the sufficient one. And so we work nonstop often to save ourselves, to create a kind of name for ourselves, to build a certain reputation for ourselves. In short, we, it's a way of trying to rescue ourselves from our own kind of despair and existential meaninglessness. And yet, Jesus invites us to come with him. Alone. Why? Because God is the one who sufficiently cares for the world. And so Jesus calls his disciples away with him. And he does the same with us. And as I looked at this passage, um, there are really three invitations that come out of this one invitation from Christ. And we're going to be exploring this over the next few weeks. Self-care in the kingdom of God means three things out of this passage, at least three things. First of all, it means that we eliminate hurry from our lives. That we eliminate hurry from our lives. Burnout comes as a result of consistently hurrying through life. And Jesus is often busy, but you never see Jesus, Jesus hurried. Because being busy is an outer condition. Hurried is an issue of the soul. And so the disciples are going from one thing to the next immediately, immediately, immediately. And Jesus pulls them away to basically say, the way of our kingdom is not the way of one thing to the next. The way of our kingdom is the way of slow, it's mustard seed, it's long haul, it's, it's sustainable over the long term. And Jesus invites us to an unhurried rhythm. And an unhurried with rhythm is the way to avoid deep burnout. The reality, though, is we live in a culture and in a city 
that just overwhelms us to hurry. We find ourselves walking fast for no reason, running up the stairs for no reason. Running down the stairs for no reason. You're on time and something is inside of you. After the first service, someone said, Pastor Rich, I woke up early. I wanted just to walk to work at a nice pace and I'm walking and I got to the subway and, and all of a sudden I saw people running. I just started walking fast with them. It's like what? something overtook me. And the pressure of our culture will overwhelm you, sucks you into its orbit in which we are just hurried through life. We live often with this external hurriedness and an internal hurriedness. I've heard people call it in this way. We live with a destination disease that we go from one thing to the next. We accomplish that one thing. We get to that one destination in life, and we're done, and we rush to the next destination in life. And we run to the next accomplishment and destination in life. And the next one. And it becomes not just an issue of, the, of, the, of our outer rhythm. It becomes an issue of our hearts. It's a mindless hurriedness that we experience. We eat our food way too fast. We walk way too fast. And in the process of doing all these things so fast, we end up having to go back to fix things, slowing the process up. And so self-care means, number one, that we eliminate hurry. I actually think there are three words to describe New Yorkers. I think it's hurried. I think it's angry and exhausted. I think those three words capture the shadow side of New York. Hurried, angry, exhausted. And Jesus invites you, come away with me. Why? To eliminate hurry from your life. This invitation in Mark 6 also is an invitation to embrace the gift of our limits. To embrace the gift of our limits. When Jesus pulls his disciples aside, he's reminding them, you are limited. You can't do everything. And our refusal to embrace our limits sets us on the course to burnout. And we all have limits. We have limits in time, limits in energy, limits in money, limits in intellect, limits because of the seasons of our lives. My biggest limit right now is having a two-year-old. You want to talk about limits? This is a limitation, all right? All right, this is, this is hard limit. I can't do everything I want to do. I can't. You are limited. And, and most of the tension in my marriage and tension at work go, comes because I refuse to embrace my limits. Rosie says to me, I don't think you can fit all of that in one day. No, no, I can't. I can, and I realize she's always right. She's always, I can't fit all of that in my day. The reality is when we go beyond our limits, we are in dangerous territory. I would go as far as to say that when we go beyond our limits and push beyond our limits, we end up in Satan's territory. This is what you see in Genesis, in the book of Genesis. God, theologian Robert Barron says that at the heart of original sin is the notion of us going beyond our limits. Look what happens in the garden. God says you can have any tree from the garden, whatever you like. They're like, this is wonderful, except that one. Just don't touch that one. They're like, no problem. They enjoyed everything, and God put a limit on them. And they went beyond the limit that God had put on them, and they end up in Satan's territory. I wonder how many of us today are in Satan's territory. And here's the irony of it. You could be doing a good thing and be doing it in Satan's territory. Amen. You could be doing stuff that God never told you to do. God said, I didn't call you to do that. I didn't lead you. That wasn't my spirit leading you to do that. And although it might be a good thing, it might be a good thing for somebody else. But because we decided to do it, the irony and the paradox is that we could be doing good things and yet be in Satan's territory. The invitation that Jesus gives us, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest, is an invitation to embrace our limits. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't do anything. 
And from time to time, I just have to say this at New Life, a pastoral word to us at New Life. It doesn't mean when we talk about Sabbath and limits that we don't do anything. One of the trends at New Life over the years, especially since Pete wrote a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality and Emotionally Healthy Church and talking about Sabbath is what happens in our church. Listen, New York is like many other churches. People go from one church to the next many times. And they get burned out and they come. And they come because they heard of something called, what is this Sabbath thing? Well, it's a rest. And they come to new life. And they come to rest. And then I go, okay, how long are you going to rest? <laughs> and then I have to remind them, you know, there's one day of rest. There's six days of work. And so to embrace limits doesn't mean you're inactive. It doesn't mean you don't do anything. It doesn't mean you're not serving, you're not volunteering, you're not being on witness for Christ. But it does mean that we do not go beyond what God has called us to do. To embrace our limits doesn't uh, eliminate activity. It focuses our activity into what God had called us to do. And so the invitation, first of all, is to eliminate hurry from our lives. We're going to be exploring this. The invitation to self-care is embracing the gift of limits. That sometimes you just have to say no. Many times you probably have to say no. But the basis of these two things come out of the third thing here. Self-care means at its core, kingdom self-care, that we enjoy the loving presence of Jesus. That we enjoy the loving presence of Jesus. The self-care I'm talking about is rooted in the love of God. It's not rooted in you trying to just... uh, Uh, Present yourself better to the world is not rooted in trying to escape the reality. It's rooted in the love of God. And perhaps the greatest uh, act of self-care is to create space so that God can care for you. Perhaps the greatest act of self-care is to create space so that God can care for you. Jesus invites his disciples to solitude, to silence. And unless we are enjoying the loving presence of Jesus, how are we going to eliminate hurry from our lives? How are we going to be transformed from the inside out if it's not for the presence of Jesus? If not, it's going to be lots and lots of willpower. But there's something about the presence of Jesus that begins to change you in ways that your willpower can't. That all of a sudden, you spending enough time with God, all of a sudden, you are transformed in ways that you didn't even know you were transformed. And you only can look back and say, man, I've been changed over the past few months. The other day, I was, I've been spending a lot of time in extra silence, meeting with my spiritual director, and just uh, extra, extra silence. And I've been seeing God, how God is changing me in that I'm doing things uh, just out of nowhere. I took Rosie to the movies, and uh, that's not out of nowhere, okay? That's not like the God trying to... <laughs> and I bought the popcorn and the soda, and the Whoppers, and the Twizzlers, and we're having a great time. And the lady charges me. She doesn't charge me for two of the candies. And so, now if I can confess for a moment, okay. In the past, I go, hmm, you know, she, this, is, and you, this saved me $40, these two candies, all right? So, and, so, <laughs> and so, I'm about to pay, and I go, Without even thinking about it. Oh, you didn't charge me for all of this. And as I'm hearing, I'm like, what am I saying here? This is like, <laughs> oh, you didn't charge me. I, I owe you 45 more dollars here. Here you go. And Rosie looked at me like, oh, okay. You know, and, so, and I realized, how, how did that happen? And I realized that when, when you enjoy, when you are in the presence of Jesus, you start doing stuff that before was hard for you. All of a sudden, it's effortless now. Because he, he's transforming you from the inside out. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Let me close with this. There's a phrase of St. Bernard of Clairvaux that has meant a lot to me as it pertains to preaching and spirituality. He says in one of his really succinct phrases, he says, when it comes to the spiritual life, we are to be a bowl 
and not a pipe. A bowl, not a pipe. He says a pipe receives and simultaneously gives out. He says a bowl waits until it's full and overflows. The reality is, in that simple illustration, that many of us are pipes. Whatever comes in immediately goes out. Whatever comes in immediately goes out. And that leads to exhaustion. We are not called to be pipes. We're called to be a bowl filled with God to the point of overflow. Amen. Let me invite you to close your eyes. Some of you today, you're exhausted, you're tired. Maybe you're on the verge of burnout. Maybe you're in burnout. Maybe you've just come out of burnout. But Jesus says to you today and every day and multiple times a day, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. I want to give us a moment to to confess our sin before God the silence of your own heart to say, Lord, I have not cultivated any time. I have lived off of my fears. I have hurried my way through life. I have said yes to much more than I should. Forgive me. Reform me. Direct me. Shape me. Lead me. I just want to give you a moment just to offer that confession and we'll, we'll sing as a response together. Lord Jesus, we confess this day that we often have lived our lives without any pausing, any recognition of your activity in our lives. Lord, that has left us to be exhausted, tired, irritable, and angry, and impatient. And yet you call us to a life of deep abiding with you out of which all we do for you is deep and powerful and transformative. And so, Lord, beginning this week and over the course of this month, would you teach us this healthy self-care that would ultimately root us in the world for good. May we see the gift that we are. Shape us, mold us create in us the kind of people you've longed us to be and longed for us to be. And so, Lord, we sing to you now words of praise and worship, thanking you for your love, which is better than life. So we pray and we now sing to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's sing together. Amen. I want to invite our prayer team to come to my left. And we have the Lord's table to my right. And today we're just scratching the surface today. And we're going to be unpacking this for the next uh, three weeks as well. But I want those, really those three invitations to serve as a framework for you to live every day. That you're asking yourself, am I hurrying this day? Impatient, am I hurrying? Am I embracing my limits? Am I, am I focusing on what God has given me to do and said yes to do? Am I enjoying this presence, this, this care of God in Jesus? And the reality is for some of us, to get to that place, the Holy Spirit needs to transform us deeply. This is why we end every time with prayer, because we believe in the formation of our lives and we believe that God can encounter us in a moment 
and transform us. And some of you, you've lived so long without doing any self-care that to now begin the journey means there are so many scripts and stories and roadblocks and blockages that the Holy Spirit needs to tear down. And this is why we come for prayer. Because the God can do in a moment what would take months for us to do. And so we have our prayer team here. And as the Holy Spirit leads you, but may this week be one of monitoring my pace, monitoring my limits, monitoring, am I really enjoying creating space for God? This serves as the foundation for our self-care. We have the Lord's table to my right where we come and take bread and we dip it in a cup and we are reminded that Jesus is the broken one, broken and poured out so that we might live whole lives and he is the resurrected one, that we might live whole lives integrated with rhythm that, that shows the marks and the signs of his kingdom. So you can come and someone will be here to offer it to you. But as we close, I want to invite you to open your hands towards heaven. If you're new to new life, we close every gathering like this. It's a way of receiving. And many of us have a hard time receiving. But we cannot give what we have not received. You can't give life if you haven't received life from God. You can't give joy if you haven't received joy from God. And so we close saying, Lord, would you pour out into me? May I be a bowl and not a pipe. That I may overflow into the world. And so with your hands and your hearts in this posture of receiving brothers and sisters and sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you. And may he keep you. May he shine his face upon you and fill you with peace. May you walk out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit, not rushing through life, embracing the gifts of limits, enjoying the presence of God. And may your life be one that is rooted, one that is centered. May you be a bowl and not a pipe this week. So I bless you all today in the strong, in the beautiful, in the caring name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen.